time now for the exchange and more expert insight on the global heat emergency. Joining me now is Michael Mann, director of the Earth System Science Center at Penn State and author of The New Climate War. And I want to get straight to some of the science here. You have been warning us about this literally for decades now, that these extreme weather events are turbocharged by that warming atmosphere that Chad just showed us. How does that work? And because it's not just about the heat, right? It's the heat now, but it can also be extreme precipitation and even extreme cold. How is all of this coming together? Yeah, thanks, Paul. It's good to be with you. And, and Chad did a really nice job sort of setting this up. Um, it really is about all of these different forms of extreme weather. Uh, you get the heat, uh, the extreme heat and dry conditions. Well, that gives you wildfires, like the wildfires we're seeing play out uh, over large parts of Europe right now. Uh, but if that heat comes with humidity, then you've got those very high heat indices, those very dangerous heat indices that Chad was alluding to. And, and Chad also uh, sort of referred uh, at least tangentially to something else that's really important here, which is the persistence of these extreme weather events. One of the things that we're seeing increasingly is not only that we get extreme heat and, and drought or extreme floods, but they stay in the same location for day after day. So you are subject to that deadly heat for multiple days. And, and that's when you see uh, the, 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 the sort of tremendous loss of life is when that heat simply persists uh, for, for days on end. And when those floods persist uh, for days on end, like we saw, for example, uh, earlier this summer in Yellowstone, well, then you get these, um, you know, these devastating consequences as well. And here's where we sort of get to where the science, you know, is right now, the forefront of the science. It's easy to say that in a warmer world, you're going to see more extreme heat, more, mm -hmm. uh, you know, I I extreme heat waves, um, intense heat waves. And, and we're seeing that, of course. But what the models aren't fully capturing is one of the more subtle impacts that we now know that climate change is having here, which is how it's changing the jet stream, in particular in the summer. It's sort of slowing down the jet stream and it's causing these weather systems to become stagnant. Again, it gives us those very persistent extreme weather events that are so damaging and so deadly. And we've seen that play out uh, increasingly summer after summer, and it's playing out right now across North America and Eurasia. Exactly. You see the extreme flooding at this point in time or those very damaging storms. Now, uh, the point is, right, what do you do about it? The U.S., just for one example, has run into another huge legislative obstacle. Joe Biden's climate plan seems to be in jeopardy now with a Democratic senator, right, standing in the way. But the U.S. is just one country. Objectively, I mean, how do we get to that point of climate action. We've been at this for decades. What is your worst fear now going forward when we see that the issue surrounding climate uh, inaction is right here in front of us? It's at our doorstep. We're living it every day. Yeah, my concern isn't, you know, what it was with the last administration, uh, the Trump administration, that unilaterally backed out of our uh, commitments to the rest of the world, the Paris Accord. Um, you know, we are the world's greatest legacy carbon polluter. We, the United States, have put more carbon pollution into the atmosphere than any other country. Right now, China is producing more carbon pollution than we are, but we have historically put far more uh, amounts of carbon pollution into the atmosphere, and that means that we have to take a leadership role. If we're going to expect China and India and other countries to come to the table, we have to take a leadership role. Now, the good news is that the Biden administration has done that. Uh, the United States under this administration is committed to lower our carbon emissions by 50 percent within the next decade, which is what we have to do worldwide to keep warming below a truly catastrophic additional three degree Fahrenheit or one and a half degrees and Celsius. So, so, Michael, unfortunately, we, we, we don't have a lot of time left, but I, I want to yeah. ask you for the here and now, what is yeah. possible? What do you want yeah. done now? Yeah. So, you know, we have to codify that, right? The Biden administration can't do that without legislation. And right now, as you alluded to, that legislation is stuck in the Senate with a Democrat, Joe Manchin, who uh, is, is basically um, refusing to sign on to uh, a, a de Democratic reconciliation bill that would provide uh, stimulus for uh, renewable energy and would provide the climate provisions that we need 
to make good on our commitments to the rest of the world. Now, the good news is that we do have a midterm election coming up, and if people care about the defining challenge of our time, the climate crisis, mm -hmm. and turn out, and we can increase those majorities, then we can pass climate legislation in the new term. Right, and it is critical, of course, here in the United States, but also critical right around the world. Michael Mann, we will leave it there for now. We'll continue to touch base with you uh, in the weeks and months ahead. Appreciate it.